Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are ya? We are at the end of February now. It just amazes me how quickly time is going. Today's episode with Jen is kind of interesting. We often chat before we start recording, and I wasn't really sure where we were going to head with this. And <laughs> it actually went to a pretty deep place. We, we start out talking about our humanity and things like farting. So if you're uncomfortable with farting, you might want to turn it off now. But some real things that happen with humanity and humanizing who we are. But we end up talking about wonder and looking at marginalized groups and how do we know if we're in the group that feels like there's something wrong with us and how do we know when we're being told by a dominant group that how we show up in the world is not okay. Jen talks a lot about the fixed perspective versus a growth perspective. We talk about perfectionism, shame, acceptance, commitment therapy act. I think it's a pretty interesting episode. It, towards the end, I kind of comment on how did we get from farts to where we are. But I think that that's what happens when we allow ourselves to just talk freely about the things that we're passionate about. And this really started with one of my clients was saying, you know, when you ask each other, you know, how are you? How are you? Like, what if you ask some different questions? And what she asked me is different than what we asked. But what we ask each other is what's a lie for you today? And that's kind of how this conversation started. I don't know. I'd be curious to know what you think. I know everybody has different thoughts about doing chit chat. Everybody has different thoughts. I want to be very linear with the podcast, tell you exactly what you're getting and go there. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. So anyways, enough chit chat. And now on to the show. Hey, Jen. Hello, Patricia. <laughs> so we were going to try something different instead of me asking how you are. I like what you ask. What's a lie for you today? Yes. What is alive for me today? Well, it's a busy day. What's alive for me today is, oof, lots of very mundane things like my to-do list, things I have to mail, taking measurements and moving house soon. So that's kind of in the background. Where am I going to put everything in what room and blah, blah, blah. So honestly, that kind of stuff is alive for me today. What is in the field of awareness right now is a nice full belly because I just ate lunch. Mm -hmm. And physical sensations wise, oh, I got my inversion table set up. So I've been hanging upside down a bit and I can kind of feel Yay. that in my hip and in my lower back. Mm -hmm. Trying to think about my thoughts today. It's funny. I read somewhere that we think 60,000 thoughts a day and that a vast majority of them, I think probably over 80% are like the same ones from yesterday. <laughs> so I've kind of been on the lookout lately for like, what's the new thought? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So interesting. What's the life for you today, my dear? Well, we chatted before we hit record and we don't really have a focus and that makes me uncomfortable because I really like being direct and to the point, and I'm concerned that we're going to be all over the place and people are going to be like, get to the point. And some of you may be, and some of you may choose to tune out, and I have to be okay with that. My son and his girlfriend are staying with us, and this morning the door was closed to the bathroom, and it's never closed, and I thought my husband knocked on the door. I saw him knock on the door, and I thought he told me that no one was in there. So I opened the door and my son's girlfriend is sitting on the toilet and it's one of those small bathrooms where you open the door and like right there, you're on like your knees block the door if you're on the mm -hmm. toilet. I'm so sorry. And apparently he just opened the door on her too. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt kind of, like she said it was okay, but I felt mortified. And then I didn't want to say anything when she got up because I felt like I apologized profusely and then I just had to say something. And she was like, it's really okay. I'm like, how do I know that it's not you're mortified and you're not, you know, with gritted teeth going like, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And we joked about it. She's like, you should have gotten Dan, her, you know, my son, he could have come <laughs> in too. 
And so she was totally fine with it. And every time she comes, I, I had a mole that was removed on an intimate part of my body. So I'm having to do some unusual things to let the wound air. And last time she was here, I was having some things go on with another personal part of my body. And you know, <laughs> what I appreciate is I'm just very open and honest about it. And she had to know about it because some of the things, you know, we share a bathroom and I needed to get some medication and I have a doctor and I called the doctor and explained in anatomically correct terms of what was going on this last time. And she's like, down there in your hoo-ha. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me very uncomfortable. So we were talking about that with my son's girlfriend because it was humorous, but I also had some probiotics on the counter. And so I crossed out the name of them and put hoo-ha on it. I love know? it. <laughs> and what I appreciate is this authenticity because the truth is we have these bodies and we have intimate things that go on with our bodies. And when somebody's in our space, it's hard to, people are going to know. And I would much rather be genuine and authentic about what's going on and to talk about it. And there are some embarrassing moments and it is intimate. And I appreciate that. So I think that's mostly what's present for me today. Mm. <laughs> yes, that is intimacy, right? I love the yeah. balance between am I embarrassed? Uh, is this funny? Like <laughs> and the authenticity and the and the being real with each other. As you were right. talking, it also made me think about perfectionism, of course, you know, mm -hmm. and shame that parades along with perfectionism. The analogy that I often use with clients is like, you know, everybody acting so surprised or like dreading, what would I say, like farting in yoga class, you know, and it's like, but we're human and we have these bodies and we have these bodily needs and they, especially with the people we're intimate with and live closely with, why would we want to be alone with all of that, right? So the fact that, I don't know, I just tend to be sort of looser about that stuff. I am too. In general. And I definitely have that that sort of moment like, oh, is it safe? Mm hmm You know? Yeah. I saw a thread on Facebook recently in a, I shouldn't say, but in a therapist group about do you fart in front of your partner? And there were quite a number of people or couples that have chosen not to do that. And I, I want to be mindful on how I respond <laughs> because I don't want to shame anybody, but I just, I can't imagine. I think the first time I farted in front of my head, it was an accident. I didn't mean to. And I think he felt really touched. And I, I don't know if I told him that it was an accident, but just when my son was here last time, he asked me to um, crack his back. And so he was laying on his belly on the floor and I, you know, was massaging his back to loosen it up. We play chiropractor in our house. And I went to crack him and I farted. He's like, did you fart? <laughs> Which made me laugh. <laughs> made me fart even more. <laughs> oh, like, so I have boys. I think this stuff is funny. I have the humor of like a 12 year old boy. And yes. I love that we can laugh about it. And I get that this is not true for all families. I, I'll let you talk in a second. But when my kids were young and they were in school and having some type of sex education. I remember we were walking the dogs and my husband was with us. And one of my sons said that they just thought the word fallopian tube was a cool word. And my husband just got really embarrassed. Mm. You know, that in his family, they, I think they called, if you went to the bathroom, they called it going stinky, you know, like a lot of shame. And mm -hmm. so yeah. my openness really embarrasses him and the kids know that it embarrasses him. And so they push it even more, which makes us all laugh <laughs> even more. Yeah, there's that dance, right, between embarrassment yeah. and humor. Right. Groundedness and sort of these airs that maybe we put on, like, <laughs> which makes it funny, right, when that kind of stuff happens. I mean, I do have a 13-year-old, and I definitely have that 12-year-old boy inside of me that just thinks things are hilarious. And then the situations where I can't do that because the social context or, or I don't think I can, right? Mm -hmm. Or I think <laughs> if we asked a lot of people and so they would agree with me that it's not appropriate for every circumstance, but I don't know. It's really funny how my older child did that just yesterday, kind of gets in the car and farts and <laughs> my daughter are like, are you kidding me? Or the dog farting or something. It's just really, it is. It's funny. It's grounding. It's that sort of humility. And I think every family has its own little like mini culture 
mm-hmm. about it that's probably reflective of a lot of the beliefs around this kind of stuff. I don't know. Like, I'm trying to actually remember in my own family of origin what that was like. I mean, it definitely wasn't very sex positive. You know, it was very Catholic and conservative and just didn't speak of these things, you know. And I, don't know, I have to sit and actually see if I can remember, but <clears throat> I imagine farting and stuff like that was like right along with that. (laughs) I think it's so humanizing and Mm -hmm. so much of, I think if you're assigned female at birth, there's even more of this. Don't make waves, don't make conflict. You know, women are told to make themselves very small so that we don't upset people. And it really teaches us to do all the accommodating in relationships. I remember when I was about 18, 19, I had a boyfriend and his mom's best friend, Dodie. I I actually went to reach out to her and I've I've probably talked about this on the podcast before. She was just so upfront and honest and I loved how candid she was because, you know, when I was 18, 19, I, I didn't know that that was even an option. And I loved just how real she was. And I think about with my kids and their girlfriends, I want to be that model to them of being authentic and genuine and saying what's on my mind and saying what's not maybe the right thing. And it was funny. My son's girlfriend said something like, he may have asked her to do something. She's like, I don't want to. Is that okay to say, or I'm not interested? And it's like, of course it is. You know, but I think we're raised to be agreeable and to be polite and we want to be disruptors. Well-behaved women rarely make history. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I would take, I would take that even a step further. Like the encouragement is to really be so proper and have, it's almost like being dressed up like a little doll to not, have all sorts of urges or needs or (laughs) desires or whatever. Like there's a lot, that's a big can of worms there actually, I think Mm -hmm. all the ways in which we're kind of in some situations, like collectively denying what is just otherwise like really just obvious. It's not uncommon when I'm struggling with something and I'll ask my husband, like, what do you think I should do? And generally he's like, just let it go. And you know, that's his perspective. I'm not faulting him on that. And I, whatever the most recent thing that I struggled with, I just knew in my heart that that just didn't work for me. And I think for people that don't like having conflict and just want to go with the flow, I think many of us are wired that way. If we have trauma, it doesn't even have to be a trauma response. And there are times when it's not worth the labor to say something. And there have been times when I've said something and I thought, (laughs) would have been better not to next time, not going to do it. But I think so often we get that message to just let it go, don't make waves. And the message that that says to me internally is that my thoughts, my needs, my feelings aren't important and that I don't want to make anybody else feel uncomfortable. And I have a right to talk about what makes me uncomfortable and what I want and what I need. I mean, this is very generic, so it's obviously going to be dependent on the situation. You have a very ponderous look on your face, so I'm really curious to know what's going on with you. I guess I was just thinking about ourselves in like, a learning environment, right? And our developmental trajectories. And I remember being a a little kid, probably elementary school, and keeping a diary, right? The key and everything, and writing all of my hopes and dreams or wishes or crushes or whatever right in there. And such a shame. It really kind of breaks my heart, actually, because a lot of what would happen is then life would happen and I would be learning. And instead of allowing myself to be like in process, my little like elementary school age journals are mostly scribbled out. Like as if I had to erase my own like little personal history (laughs) because it didn't work out as opposed to coming from a place where I'm allowed to learn, grow, be different. It's almost like, it's so funny thinking about like cancel culture. Like now, like I had, I canceled myself (laughs) because it didn't Mm -hmm. align with what I learned as opposed to letting myself learn. It's funny, my daughter's doing the whole fixed mindset versus growth mindset stuff right now. And it was very much like just so, so fixed, you know, Mm -hmm. you either had it or you didn't, you were either this or that and not allowing ourselves to be changeable, to, to learn. I mean, this has so much, I think about this with my approach to counseling. I don't like using a pathology lens. I like using a learning lens. There's room for both in there, but primarily 
that we are just learning. What did we learn? How's that working? What context did it work in? What context now doesn't it work in? Right. And allow it. You don't have to go back and like scribble out whatever it is, whether it's farting in yoga class. <laughs> this is pertinent to me right now because I'm, as you know, <laughs> dating, right? Mm -hmm. My partner and I broke up, a, a, I don't know how many months ago now, but, and so that process of getting to know somebody. And it's so multifaceted and complex and fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like to use the context of understanding behavior in terms of most of what we learned was for survival and it works until it doesn't work. And then what do we need to do to figure out what works for us now? But you and I have talked about this that I think it's so, so many of us have this idea ingrained that if we choose something, we have to stick with it and it's not okay to rechoose and it's not okay to not finish things and it's, you know, not okay to decide that there's something else that we want or this work for this amount of time and then to move on. And I think so many of us have gotten those lessons, especially if you have challenges with executive functioning that we find something we're really fascinated with. We get very focused. We want to collect, we gather, we buy all the things for that. We get enough of it and then we're ready for something else. Or we have these great ideas, but we end up not following through on them because those are skill sets that we may not have. And the narrative is, you know, you don't finish things, you leave things undone, you collect all this stuff, you're a quitter, as opposed to I was interested and then it didn't work and I wanted to do something else. And is that okay? Which is part of what I hear you talking about as well. Yeah, like on to the next thing. Yeah. I do remember being both shamed and then feeling shame. And it's just such a, you know, I just think about collectively all the human energy that is being siphoned off into this, you know, shame based in something that's fixed, perfectionistic, unrealistic, mythological, actually. <laughs> God, what could we do if we could get all of that like power back, right? All of that energy back collectively. And really, I love that I think a lot of educators and teachers are making a point of this to Carol Dweck's book about mindset, right? That really embracing diversity and learning and developmental trajectories and throughout the entire lifespan, right? Not just milestones when we're babies, but that we go through these things and that we're allowed to learn, edit, edit furiously, actually. And it's a beautiful thing to let ourselves grow and not something to be ashamed of but something to right. own and celebrate. Right. I think so much of our society is about doing and productivity and this idea that things are linear, that you start, you work on these steps, you set a goal, you achieve the goal, you set another goal. And you and I have talked about this quite a bit, but I think when you're a deep feeler and a deep thinker, our life is so much more about what we experience in the moment that's not goal directed, but we end up feeling like we're not doing enough because so much of what we enjoy is in the being, enjoying the sensations and the scents and the sights and the sounds and the feelings. And there's not as much, I don't know, credence, support for being as opposed to doing. And so that really creates a set of conflict. And maybe collecting and gathering things is something that brings somebody joy. I mean, if you look at minimalism, that that runs contrary to it. But you know, everything is supposed to be stark and linear and goal oriented. And I don't know that that really works for neurodivergent brains. And how can we reframe that to really delight in what serves us, even if it's counter to what neurotypicals and society in general endorses and supports? Yeah, I'm so curious about how these ideas came to be, right? This like what gives rise to the fixed mindset, right? This, mm -hmm. um, I often talk with clients about how we're verbs, right? Not nouns. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I've mentioned it before on the podcast, like Marshall Rosenberg's work, nonviolent communication. He had a few fascinating YouTube videos about how the English language is like the language of kings and like who to punish and who mm -hmm. to praise and these like real, okay, and that's fixed, right? That's that's fixed. And then not only is it fixed on the individual, but it's also fixed in like a value system, like of course, you know, and, and then in a judgment and whose perspective is being espoused versus who's being silenced or whose story isn't being told. And I mean, I think it's really, it's important because those are the types of things that really frame and shape our society and the ways in which 
it's not sustainable and it's also not true. It's not realistic Mm -hmm. that everyone should be this typical. And if you're not that, then you've missed the mark and we're going to pathologize that. It's like, no, diversity is what's true. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. there's lots of different ways to learn and grow in all sorts of different environments. And there's no right answer. There's pros and cons to each choice that we make. Right. I think it often depends on which side of the, and there shouldn't be a line. And I I don't know how else to articulate this. So if you can help me, because I, I don't want to add to what doesn't work. What I can do is be very concrete. If I'm the only HSP that I know, and I'm only around neurotypicals, then I'm going to really believe that there's something wrong with me because I am literally in the minority. And I don't know that there are more people that think and operate the way that I do. And so the message that I may get from neurotypicals is to not be so sensitive, think too much, I worry too much, and then I believe that that's what the truth is. As I surround myself with more HSPs and people that are like me, then what I can see is, oh, the people that design the system have brains that work one way, that's not how my brain works, and to create a community and a way of living that supports how my brain works. And then I can see that this is a system that was not designed by HSPs to support me. I mean, we can talk about this in terms of all different marginalized groups, but I'm trying to be concrete and not be vague. And so what I hear you talking about is, where are you and which side of that are? Are you the one that's defining how everybody should be based on what's worked for you and you don't want change because it threatens the status quo because this is your worldview? Or are you saying, there are lots of brains and lots of diversity and lots of ways that people have been oppressed and marginalized. And how can we change things to make things more equitable? Because in a larger context, I think it's up to us, not the marginalized groups to work on those inequities. So the burden doesn't have to be on those marginalized groups that we need to stand up for those groups to say, this is not okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. How did we get from farts to talking about marginalized Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested. Obviously, we talk about this a lot, you and me. And oh, I think just being aware that our language sets us up for this, mm-hmm. that anytime you you take and discuss the perspective of one side you're missing a bunch of others right Mm -hmm. I think we just like just could know that (laughs) it's part of uh part of the reason why I love act so much acceptance and commitment therapy is that it's really grounded in this relational frame theory Mm -hmm. which talks about that's double-sided the double-edged sword of language and being in context and it depends and that just like again one thing we started talking about is like, let yourself wonder. Anytime you think you are right, question it, right? Because you may be right. I'm not saying you're wrong, but what are all the other, what perspective is being not articulated because the nature of our language makes it that we can really only articulate one thing at a time, our right. perspectives. How do you even get to that place where you know that there is more than one perspective? Because so many of the listeners have been told, so I'm going to go back down to just the HSP experience Mm -hmm. because I I love being concrete, but this branches out to every marginalized group that there ever was. You're getting this message of how you show up in the world is not okay and you need to be more like us. Then how do you have that awareness that, wait, how I am is okay and what you're telling me is not being respectful and inclusive, that your version of the story is not what my experience is. Yeah. I mean, I love the one, there's been a meme on Facebook that's, you know, represents all manner of minority communities, marginalized communities. And the caption under it is just like, I promise I'll teach my babies to love your babies. Mm -hmm. And I think it really comes down to how we educate and how to teach critical thinking and that it's okay. It's almost like, <laughs> I hate to be critical of our K-12 system, but it's overly much. And But I'm kind of critical of everything, I guess, which is the point. Is that, <laughs> that, that if you're brought up from age, you know, five to 18 to really feel like there's right answers and wrong answers because of the expediency of doing that, right, in our mm-hmm. system, 
it really like the learning imprint there, right? And guest debate teams can at least get to there's, you know, you can be assigned to argue one side or the other of something. Mm -hmm. But even just to reduce it to two viewpoints is really kind of missing the richness of it all. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm trying to answer your question. Yeah. Well, these are hard questions. I don't know that I don't know that we can adequately I find it difficult to have language to express what my feelings are. Yeah, it's I think that's a big thing. It's like really honoring the limitations of our language because we're using these little symbolic syllables, right? So auditory, sometimes visual, auditory right now, mm -hmm. to try to capture something that is so enormous. Right, all of our experience and and our our concepts and how they relate and and everything that if we could just, it's sort of humble. I think there's that and making friends with uncertainty, being okay with not knowing. Yeah, I think that's a huge one. Is learning how to be in that discomfort of not knowing is where vulnerability happens. It's where change happens and increasing that distress tolerance. And I'm not asking anybody to do that in a way that's dysregulating, but to just get curious and to notice that you've probably been doing it. Often the stories that we tell ourselves are, I can't do this, this is too hard, I don't like this because it feels intense, but chances are you've been doing it and you've gotten through it and you're just going through another wave of it. So how can you reframe what's going on so that you tell yourself a new story? I was just working with a client around this yesterday of they're anticipating this change coming up, but for the last year they've been dealing with this. So we really spent time looking at, you've already been going through this, but what you're telling yourself about it is what's creating the suffering. Yeah. Yeah. It's what's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to wrap up. Is there anything that you want to share? Any questions maybe for the listeners of how they can start looking at this differently? Well, kind of what I was saying about, you know, living age five to 18 in such a way, like, can we wonder, can mm -hmm. we imagine what we would look like, right? Both as, as individuals and then as a society of wondering, pondering, <laughs> mm -hmm. being, being curious, loving the questions more than the answers and knowing that answers can change depending on the context and situation and stuff. And even as we age, I may go through the same, let's call it even like an attachment injury, right? It's going to look a lot different from 14 than it did at 24, 34, 44, 54, right? It's like it's, it changes and we grow and it's not that we haven't achieved something if it comes back to kind of hit us again emotionally, you know, where we mm -hmm. have to ponder it from a different point in our path and that if we could really just... I'll be okay with, with that. Like if, if that was nurtured in us, mm -hmm. things like wonder, curiosity, awe, right? These are such healthy psychological states to be in as opposed to, I know, I'm certain. <laughs> right. And that it's okay to question that that's part of how we learn is that it's okay to question authority and to question why things are the, how they are, mm -hmm. that that's also how we have critical thinking and allowing for that pushback and that exploration as opposed to it is because I said it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything else? No, my dear. How about you? No, I think this turned out okay. We thought this was the episode that we'd have to trash. I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. From farts to pondering wonder. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd love if you recall, do you remember what you were saying about your idea about curiosity and wonder? Oh, yeah. Well, I was talking with a client. I want to give credit, but of course I can't with a client. But so this is not mine, but we were talking about curiosity and it's, it's countless how many times they say session about holding something with kindness and curiosity that that awe is curiosity like with glitter. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> And it really, it really is my favorite. It's one of my favorite states. I love it. <laughs> I love it. All right. I think that's all I have, unless you have anything. No, thank you. To be continued, I'm sure. Thank you for being here today. And thanks for trying something different. Thank you, my dear. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. Hey, again. 
So I'm curious, what did you think? Did you follow it? If you're still here, you must have made it through. So I guess it wasn't that bad. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to tell when we're done recording how it goes and what we talked about. I've been using this program for creating show notes. It's artificial intelligence, which I know is a hot topic right now. But it actually suggests a couple of suggestions for the subject of the podcast. And it spits out some ideas for show notes, which has really been helpful. So I'm appreciating artificial intelligence. If anything you heard today resonates for you, if you struggle with being human, if you have a lot of shame, if you have a fixed mindset, if you're wanting to look at the things that aren't working for you, if you struggle with relationships, any of those things, and you want to work with either Jen or me, you can reach out to Jen at Jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com, or you can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. I think that's all I have. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying the first two months of this new year in 2023, or if you're listening to this at some point in the future, I hope things are going well. If you're struggling, that's okay too. If you need to get help and things are really bad, please reach out and get support. I always want to validate and normalize that we're not always in the best places all the time, but I certainly don't want anybody to be struggling or suffering in a way that's not working. I think that's all I have. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's your superpower. Have a blessed day.